everybody, how everybody, Sam Goodman, the Hopner, coming to you from the Pale Horse Media Co. Studios in the sunny and the beautiful downtown Phoenix, Arizona. On today's podcast replay, we are joined by the amazing Andrea Baker. Here we go. Welcome. We have the one, the only, the amazing Andrea Baker with us today. Um, it's been a long time coming. I'm excited to have you here. I, I was sitting there thinking, like, <laughs> why didn't we do this sooner? That's probably the first thing that I was thinking about. Um, but before we jump into everything else, for those out there that might not know you, tell everybody a little bit about who you are. Um, so I don't think I'm the one and only Andrea Baker. I'm pretty <laughs> sure there's there's other people. There's a mezzo-soprano, actually, with the name right. Andrea Baker. She's quite good. Um, but I, I'm just somebody. I used to work in industry as a safety professional for um, about 10 years with a, with a big company. Um, and I heard about human and organizational performance while I was working there. Um, I think the first person I heard it from was internally, but the first person that is sort of the ideas actually stuck with me was after I heard from, uh, Dr. Todd Conklin. And, um, I just kind of became obsessed with the concepts. I wanted to know how to speak to them, to teach other people around me. And, uh, so I, I did that within my job for a while. And just within the past few years, I, I left that company and now I get to talk to anyone else who wants to hear about it. So just, uh, I, I, I wore it out, you know, where I was. And so (laughs) I got to wear some other people out with the ideas, but it really is my passion. I, I I love this concept. I think it um, not only helps industry, but some of the the key concepts just, just help us be better people. And, um, and I feel, I mean, I'm very lucky that I get to do something that I love for a living. So, yeah, absolutely. So, Kind of backing up just a little bit, because you said you you made your way into safety. And I always like to ask people this question, how the heck did you find yourself into the weird, wonky world of industrial safety? By accident. (laughs) I think. I don't know. I don't know if I've ever actually made an active decision my entire life. I think things happen to me by accident in general. (laughs) But um, so I went to school for engineering, for chemical engineering. And at some point, somebody said that, you know, a good thing to do when you're in university is you should at some point do an internship. So I couldn't argue with that. And so I looked at the available internships at my university and there was one that was about safety. And when you read environmental health and safety, like job description, it really sounds like you're going to save the world. You're like, you know, I make sure people go home the same way they come in. I make sure the environment is, you know, in better position than it was. And, and so I decided that that sounded cool. And so I interned. Um, and while I was interning, they asked me if I wanted to apply for a full-time position after I got out of school. And, you know, I, argued for a little bit that I wasn't sure. And they said, you know, just do it as a backup plan. And then my backup plan became my real plan. So (laughs) Um, it's it's always such an interesting story to hear how people kind of, I've not met a single person yet. I believe that has actively made that choice to me. Yeah. When I grow up, I want to be a safety professional. I mean, that probably happens now, right? There's, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot more awareness around the career, uh, there's a lot more uh, college level programs. There's there's a lot more paths, I guess, into the career. But most people go, yeah, I just woke up one day and here I was. I mean, that's just <laughs> I just, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure how I got here, but yeah. And I just I remember uh, even though so the philosophies of like how you are supposed to be a safety person. I remember as I was learning them that I was confused by them. Mm-hmm. One of the very first conversations that I had that was like um, me being coached as an intern. Um, my direct boss at the time said, Andrea, what you need to understand working at this company is you need to understand that all accidents are preventable. Mm. And, you know, I'm a sassy college kid, right? So I don't, I don't know how to play politics or anything. And so I'm just like, I, that doesn't sound right. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, I'm pretty sure they call them accidents for a reason. And I'm pretty sure if they were all preventable, then we wouldn't have any accidents. And he looked me dead in the eye and he's like, Andrea, you're either going to have to get on board with this or you're not going to make it long here. Um, (laughs) That's that's so funny because um, I I worked for an organization that the shower may nameless, Um, several of them had a similar mindset. Um, but it was the same thing. The exact response to your question would have been, well, that's because there's no such thing as accidents. That's why we call them incidents. Duh. Right. They're, they're incidents. <laughs> they're not accidents. <laughs> so it's just, I just kind of, I can't help yeah. but laugh when I hear that. <laughs> 
I mean, and it's not the organization's fault. I mean, we just, we all learned this at the mm -hmm. same time, right? And you become indoctrinated into that thought process and it's yeah. hard to see anything differently than that. And yeah. so um, it was good to get to see sort of both sides of the hop mentality, you know, be indoctrinated right. into, right. you know, safety one thought process and then kind of mm. see how it changes. So, so at, at some point, um, at some point you obviously had some, I don't know if I call it a rift or some, something with kind of traditional safety that made you veer away from safety one or kind of more traditional approaches to safety. Um, what, what pushed you in that direction? What, what kind of made you go, okay, there's something else out there and, and this kind of old school, I'm just gonna use air quotes, old school kind of way of business might not be the best way to go. I want to maybe move in a little bit of a different direction. Um, I don't know that there was a moment in which I thought differently. I think what happened for me is that the, the moment that I remember is when um, Todd Conklin came to talk to my facility, my, my mm -hmm. site, right? And he was putting words to things that I didn't have words for, but I had been trying to express. Yeah. And so I guess maybe from the beginning, I was uncomfortable with the direction I was given as a safety professional, how I was supposed to do things. And so I pushed the envelope in places that I felt comfortable pushing the envelope, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that the way that I was thinking at the time that there were other people that thought that way and that there was actually right. language to describe what it was. Right. And there was logic behind it that was based in psychology. I didn't know any of that. All I yeah. knew is that, oh, you know, so-and-so is telling me that I should do an audit this way, but it doesn't feel like the right thing to do. And so I'm going to change it a little bit and I'm going to try mm -hmm. it this way. Um, so I think more distinctively, I remember realizing I wasn't alone. And that was a more, <laughs> that was, that That's, gave me more power to, to act yeah. differently. Cause I was like, oh, wait, I'm not strange. Yeah. I'm not alone. <laughs> There's other people. And yeah. maybe a bunch of other people think this way too. We've just been so, um, we've, we've been playing this, this corporate game for so long mm -hmm. that we don't yeah. remember, right? We don't remember that it didn't make sense when we first started. So. Yeah, it, it's it's so funny because um, I was introduced to it a little a little kind of backwards, I guess, because I was at the point of just being like, okay, I'm done with this job. Like, I'm gonna I'm leaving safety. I, I'm, I'll go live under a bridge before I continue to <laughs> to work in this. Just at that point with traditional yeah. safety, yeah, yeah. and you know, just just the whole kind of piece of it, just just all of it. Um, and then I had a friend that actually dropped off uh, Decker's Safety Differently book, which is a horrible place to start, by the way, for anyone. <laughs> anyone that's, that's, I, would, I would suggest you to, to go read Todd's stuff. There's a lot of great stuff out there before you get to Safety Differently you know, and you read this textbook, which is a great book. You know, it's awesome. It got me started down the path. It's just, it's drinking uh, from a fire hose, right? right so exactly. it's, it's a little bit hard. Yeah. So yeah, I understand. Yeah, what but you you're mean. going, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, and then, then to wake up to the fact that, um, that there is a community out there, right? That mm -hmm. these kind of, at the time, these 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 um, kind of rogue thoughts, I guess, that we're having at the time. I, I remember, I remember at at that particular organization, um, beginning to have that conversation with other safety professionals um, around hop and around safety differently. We would literally go into the conference room and shut the door and whisper about it, <laughs> right? Because it was, it was like this super secret meeting. Like, Don't let this anybody know. Secret secret this society is, of hot people. Sacrilege. Yeah. We're saying all accidents are not preventable. Don't let anybody <laughs> <say it. laughs> But I, I, I remember it like it was yesterday because the, the, the very like week that I'd, I'd received that book and we were starting to have some of these kind of conversations. Um, Cause again, people were kind of hiding in plain sight that had these views. Yeah. Uh, just, just no comfort in expressing them yet in this particular organization. And the very next day, we're standing in front of a banner that says, you know, one million man hours since our last OSHA record. Well, yay, we got zero, right? And the very next day after that, an employee cut their hand on something <laughs> and didn't have a recordable, you know, it's just, just that, just the whole irony of the entire situation, which then kind of set me off on a warp. <laughs> down, down, down. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's always interesting to me to hear how people find their way into that because it's a journey, right? I mean, um, I, I make no bones about it that I'm on a journey. I'm just continually learning, right? I, I don't think that there's there's an end Absolutely. in sight for, for yeah. any of us, probably, right? <laughs> I don't think so, because it's um, and, and maybe that's one of the reasons why I love this 
area so much is because I, I don't think that I have all of the answers to anything. Yeah. And I always get to learn from people that are putting these concepts into practice yeah. um, and what it looks like for them. Right. I, I mean, I know what it looked like for me. I know mm -hmm. what it looks like when I go, you know, to an organization and help them for the time that I'm there. Yeah. But then there's so many people that are passionate about this, that they're willing to give you the, the bigger, broader picture of, you know, we tried out, you know, using hop concepts and we started to shift how we do observations and we started mm -hmm. to shift, you know, how we think about, you know, how we're going to write procedures and, and then the practicality of the physical things that people go do differently when they yeah. start to think differently becomes exciting that I don't know that any of us could write a comprehensive program to cover all that or you know predict how that will work because it emerges from each group a little bit differently as they yeah. start to apply this thought process to what they do day in and day out so yeah it's fun it's fun to keep learning from people for for me that was that was one of the the, the biggest differences um moving into thinking about things a little differently right in the traditional safety space it was always very cut and dry there's one right answer to things um, if the right answer is typically a rule, right, or a better procedure, right? A, 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 I won't say better. Let me say lengthier procedure, <laughs> something around those lines. Of, or it was such such simplistic answers um, that aren't really answers, but we leaned on them as answers for a very long time. As, as, as you mentioned, one, everything's preventable, or the the good old fashioned, just try harder, be more be more aware, right, and everything will be fine. Right. Um, hazard recognition. We have to increase people's ability to recognize right. hazards. Exactly. That was yeah, exactly. You know, that was exactly. What favorite. we need to do is write down our stop work policy. That will make them realize that they should have stopped work. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of this this whole this whole thing, right? To where you know, as a practitioner in the past, and or in a practitioner in, in a more traditional sense. Um, you're almost forced into that kind of thought process of being, well, yeah, I have to provide this one right answer and it's, it's got to be the perfect answer. Mm -hmm. And I think for me moving into um, kind of this, this newer view of things, um, there's a lot of empowerment in the fact of being able to say, I don't know. <laughs> right? yeah. there's, a, there's a great group of people out there. There's a massive community out there that we all kind of, kind of come together. Um, I always brag about uh, LinkedIn because I hated LinkedIn for a really long time because it was freaking LinkedIn, right? It looks like LinkedIn. Um, but there was there's such a community growing in that space to where we can just have open conversations of saying, I don't know, I'm I'm not a guru, I'm not uh, anything like that. Let's let's figure this thing out together. So seeing that community kind of grow out of that notion mm -hmm. of being able to just say, I don't know, none of us have all the answers. No organization has all the answers, right? right? But we can kind of come together and create something cool. And that's an interesting thought process to not only like live by, but then yeah. also have to apply within a corporation, right? So right. I oftentimes when people are asking like, well, how, how do you do, like, how do you do hop, right? Yeah. How do you, I want to do it. Um, there's, it's seductive to think that there's like a 10 step program to, yeah. this is how you implement it. This is how you do it. Yeah. But I have not found in practice that there is a 10 step program yeah. be because we recognize now in a way that we maybe did not verbalize before that we are existing in complex systems, right? So there's no, gonna, there's no perfect solution set that's gonna apply right. to everyone. Right. We have to build our own path and there might be some tips and tricks on how to build your own path. Mm -hmm. But to think that there's one answer or that there's always a right answer that, that is actually ordered system view of the world, right? Mm -hmm. That there is a, there's a best practice, there is a root cause, there is one answer. And so as we start right. to recognize how HOP applies in organizations, I've actually found that I'm starting to recognize how it applies like in personal life and even like yeah. how I would interact as, you know, somebody labeled as a consultant. Oftentimes their people are asking me for the answer mm -hmm. and I have to continually remind myself that although I feel pressure to give an answer, I don't actually have the answer. There is right. no the answer to this, right? right <laughs> There's, right, right. I, you know, none of us, neither the person talking to me nor I know enough context about what's happening to have mm -hmm. an answer. The answer is that we go talk to the people that right. are doing that program or applying that and we teach them about these thought processes and they help change things from the inside out. There is no, yeah. so so that's, that's uh, I think a continual journey that requires, um, Making sure that your ego doesn't get in the way, right? Because right. yeah, you're well, and, and, ex and especially in a profession that has um, um, long since been driven towards this path of priesthood, almost, 
right? Of, of being the person that, that's supposed to hold all the answers always. Right. right? To, and unfortunately, what happens is we see a lot of practitioners that just end up kind of pew pew from the hip and just kind of make stuff up because they don't know the answers, but they're expected to, right? So, which never that's a weird social so position to be in, right? Your, exactly. your people yeah. believe that you should know the answers, but- What do we you pay don't... you for anyways, if you don't have all the answers, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And so it takes well, a little bit of practice to be in that space and be okay with being in that space. So. Right, well, and it's, it's, it's interesting because um, organizations really love that clear linear approach to things. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's interesting to, to me, it's interesting to watch them go through this acceptance of almost chaos, right? That, that they don't really have control over everything. And it's, it's a really interesting, just, just interesting to me to see that because it, it's, it's almost an a level of acceptance that they have to go through that, okay, things are complex and it's yeah. not this perfectly clear, straight, strategic, there's the, the corporate road, strategic straight line that leads us from point A to point B, especially in something like this, right? It's, that's the hardest part that I have seen. One of, one of the harder pieces I've seen for organizations to accept is, as you said, there's not a 10-step program to become a world-class hop-based organization, right? Right. Um, give it time. Someone, someone will, will make a PDF. Email. Somebody will make one at some point, right? And then, <laughs> and then we can see, but you know, we're, we've been trying to hold off as long as possible. The community is like, don't try to make it into a program. It's not a program. That, that's the first, that's usually the first conversation, right? Is this isn't a program. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, fortunately we're all horrible marketers. So we don't create this canned pack thing and try to, try to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But before, before we get too far away from, from the um, kind of traditional safety stuff, mm -hmm. I have to ask you, because I, I, this isn't a part of it, but I am in the middle of a, I'm the safety sucks guy. So I'm in the middle of a safety sucks mini series. What piece, so I'm just gonna ask you one question around it. Mm -hmm. What piece, um, and because you, you've had your foot in both sides of this, right? I mean, you've been in traditional safety, you've, you've transitioned towards hop, you've kind of seen the, the, best and worst of, of kind of that whole thing. What frustrates you the most about traditional safety? Oh, um, oh, there's, there's so many thoughts going through my head. If I had to pick, if I had to pick one, um, what frustrates me the most about traditional safety? I, I guess it, um, it has to be this, this notion that there is a right and wrong way to do things, period, in the world, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, there is a right and wrong way. And the fact that oftentimes, because there's so much to understand about what's happening in our system, we don't even know where that information came from. And so in order to feel like you could survive, you had to hold on to the right and wrong way, right? You had to know what those rules were. And there was um, an inability to use creativity because there was the fear that creativity could kill someone, right? So the I'm going to hold on to these rules. These rules weren't created by me. They're created by some authority or some regulatory body. And as long as we make sure that we are towing the line with these rules, everything should be okay. Yeah. And the fear that any sort of deviation from a rule as written can cause catastrophic failure prevented us from understanding that sometimes as written, you couldn't accomplish the task and follow that right. rule. And so right. it was, it. this is what it is. If I had to put it into words, what frustrated me the most is that there was incentives all around to put our head in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. The less you knew, the more you could live in mm. the square boxes that we created that was yeah. safe. And the more you knew, the more you realized that that's not how things worked. And right. so there was a lot of incentive to not learn anything. It's so easy though, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that was the thing. That's the thing with it, right? It's so easy because it's safety. And I, I don't want to get too far into my own, into my own personal rant here with some of that, but it, we're, 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 we have similar thoughts there <laughs> because <laughs> for me, it, it, it stems from the same thing is that every time that we would have an unintended outcome happen, it was always, well, we just need to do the same thing harder. 
right? If yeah. and, and nothing ever, nothing ever got better, right? We, we never actually did anything to, to make anything better or make work suck less or to make people any safer, right? We didn't actually do anything. But we were all working we, really hard. And that's the part right. that we, everyone was working really hard and everyone mm -hmm. had the right intent, right? We, yeah. everyone, but we just, it was almost like um, we were shown the wrong reality. It was right. like, there were two options of, you know, there's the pretend reality that we can exist in, or there's what is actually happening. <laughs> Somehow we were just all continually shown the pretend yeah. reality and reinforced with that thought process over and over again, until you'd have a discussion with somebody who's physically doing the work. And, and it seems like you come from two different planets. They're like, yeah, yeah but no, that's not how yeah. it actually works. That's not practical. And you're like, but you have to do it to be safe. And you care about your safety, right? And the company cares about your safety. And, and it was just sort of this weird game of trying to um, coerce people into following right. practices that in reality probably weren't assisting them at the time and certainly yeah. weren't practical what, things that people would do at three o'clock in the morning when you weren't there, right? So. Ex exactly. And then even, even looking back at that, right? Many organizations, we did find ourselves in that position of going, well, if people only cared more, right? If they, if they only cared more, if we could just figure out how to make people care more about their safety, then they would follow the rules harder and everything would be, would be okay. So we, lots of stand downs, lots of that kind of stuff, just, just in general in their, in their lives, right? Way, way back when. Yeah. I remember it like it was yeah. yesterday. Oh, I, I just, I have that, that image. Uh, I've got the picture somewhere. I, I need to find it. I'm going to dig it out one of these days because I, I was, I was joking about the, uh, what it's, that's not joking. It's true um, about standing in front of the banner, and then the very next day, someone someone mm -hmm. had an injury. The day of that injury, they had, had commissioned and gave us like these big tubes full of these pictures, prints, these massive poster size prints of our picture in front of the banner, so we could hang them and put them in, <laughs> in their office. That's great. It was. Yeah. You, you can't make it up. No, it was, the, the irony of the <laughs> moment. You're like, oh man. Yeah. That was, uh, I had a very similar moment when we had a, a, a very serious event at one of the places that I was working at. And there was an employee who um, was working, it was an end mill, but we'll say drill press because it's easier for people to picture. Sure. Rotating drill bit, right? And, and had gloves on. And in the process of wiping metal chips away with a brush, the brush got pulled into the drill bit and then the glove on his right hand got pulled in. He instinctively grabbed for his right hand with his left hand, his left hand got pulled in. And he had several amputations. And um, I remember walking into the area where it happened, right? He was taken out by ambulance and I walked into this, this small machine shop where the incident happened. And when he walked in, it's a, it's a small room, white cinder block walls and, I'll never forget the visual image of seeing, you know, just blood on all of the equipment and all over these yeah. walls. And you look at the piece of equipment that has two sets of gloves and definitely tendons and other things wrapped around it. And there's a yellow sign on that piece of equipment that says, do not wear gloves while operating equipment. And I just remember thinking, well, clearly that rule wasn't enough. Right. So right, right, right. whereas before I would look at it and say, well, this is why you follow the rule. This is why the rule exists. At that point, I was a little bit farther in my hop journey. And I said, well, clearly that rule didn't keep us safe. Right. Um, and so luckily, you know, just the end of the story, because I don't want to leave people with like a cliffhanger, but we ended up <laughs> learning from people that do the job and understanding why you would wear gloves around rotating equipment. Instead of having this cardinal rule, they taught us about this neat trick that a lot of them had learned from people who taught them to work in machine shops, which is yeah. you cut a slit in the bottom of your glove. So if you do have to wear gloves around something that's moving, if it gets caught, it'll pull the glove off your hand instead of pull the fingers off your hand. And then we did some research and we found that Ford Motor Company had nice. actually gone out and invented those gloves with the yeah. tearaway fingers yeah. that we didn't even know existed. Right. Mm -hmm. And so different thought process of being able to fail safely. But I just, sure. that image of don't wear gloves on this piece of equipment. Well, what, what always really left me um, kind of unsettled post injury, um, I've, I've had one very similar to that, 
um, not necessarily with gloves, but if you think about the kind of large pump kind of hand rotating some some pulleys and the hand caught into it, you can imagine the kind of damage that it does with a with with a large motor, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what really le left me unsettled with a lot of the events that I had the opportunity to be involved in, um, and that doesn't even sound right to say the opportunity to be involved in, but the opportunity to to, to witness and see and and, and learn from. Um, was the fact that organizations were very quick to turn around and blame the employee for cutting off their own fingers, right? Just, just as that example, we're going, well, you know, if Bob must have just wanted to die, I guess, you know, it, it was just, it, it was that, right? Mm -hmm. It was, it was that, well, do you really think as an organization that in having that conversation is hard, especially with a, a, a boardroom, mm -hmm. right? It's like, do you really think that that person, they would have known that that was going to be the outcome, that they would have proceeded? Right, and, and, and to the point that we were kind of talking about, um, the employees are just out there doing what they need to do and trying to be efficient most of the time, right? And it seems like um, from the organization's perspective, as long as things are going well, we don't mind to make up that slack in production by them taking those shortcuts and those workarounds, um, which all seem to be quite natural, right? As we seek efficiency, mm -hmm. um, we don't mind that as long as efficiency is the outcome. But as soon as it's some deviation from the expected outcome, we're very quick to say, well, you know, John Doe should have known better. Their mm -hmm. fault, not ours. We had the sign up that said they shouldn't wear their gloves. We did our part. Yeah. That was, yeah, just, oh, oh, oh. And I think one of the parts that makes this concept so difficult to use is that, mm -hmm. you know, when we're talking about these things, these are truths about how we interact with each other inside and outside organizations, right? right? So yeah. the the sheer number of assumptions and biases that kick in when somebody suffers something that we would not want to happen to us yes. is we're really quick at making sure that we separate ourselves from that person. Cause if, if, right. if it could happen to us, well, then we have to spend energy to do something differently. And all of us want to conserve energy, right? So the fastest way for me to convince myself, I don't have to do anything is by labeling that person as lesser than me in some way. At, at intent, right? There has to be some intent there, right? You have to, right. have to insert a tent, intent, yeah. And we say, I mean, our laws are written this way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's suddenly we're within an organization. Our mission on this hop journey is actually to function as a society of people that is functioning differently than most of the external societies that we belong to. Not, not all of them. There's actually some countries that are closer to this way of thinking sure. in how their whole societies is structured. And it's really interesting to teach in those areas because sometimes it feels like you're just saying like the sky's blue. They're like, yes, no, we, we believe like, what are you, why are you here? Like, what are you saying right. that we don't already understand? Um, and then there's other societies, um, you know, that this is so far different from how the structure of their family life works and how their politics work, that this is a huge departure in thought process. Right. And so it's always interesting to see the gap. Um, but that's a tall order, right? That's a, it is a tall order to say, as an organization, we are going to choose to have a different set of running rules and operating rules of how we treat each other mm -hmm. than you would outside of here. Because in most cases, a police officer pulling you over for breaking a rule is not going to ask you operational learning questions to figure out why it was logical for you to break that rule so that he can help the town learn how to fix that intersection or change that sign. That's not how that is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So to think that we are going to do it separately, that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult for us to, to wrap our head around it. Well, even going down that path a little bit um, because organizations uh, especially when you kind of start having the conversation around kind of the hot principles, right? They're very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, you love that. Love that. Oh, wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Let's talk about blame. Right. That's, that's, that's kind of where they go. Well, oh, hold on a second, but it feels good to blame people and we have to hold people accountable. Damn it. There's usually a damn it inserted after that. So what do you, what are we, what do we do? What, what, what would you tell those folks out there that, that get so hung up on this, this need that, uh, or this belief that, that, that we need to beat people, it seems, into compliance, or maybe compliance is a little, probably the wrong word, we're just kind of compliance on the brain of what we're talking about, but to beat people into being better employees, to being safer. Mm. Um, what, what would you tell those folks? Because they seem to get kind of hung up on that, that one in particular sometimes. <laughs> For sure. And, and it's something that I was hung up 
on originally, right? And when I heard these concepts for the first few times, which takes a long time for them to sort of settle in. But when I, when I heard them for the first few times, I was like, so are we like preaching anarchy? Are people just like allowed to do whatever they want? I'm, I'm having trouble seeing how this fits into the real world. I get it theoretically, but what does it look like in the real world? Right, right. Um, what I had to come to terms with, which I try to help explain to other people, um, is that a lot of what we're struggling with is a misunderstanding of what accountability is. Um, accountability cannot be used interchangeably with HR disciplinary action mm -hmm. and, and HR disciplinary action shouldn't be used interchangeably with blame. Accountability is a person's own willingness to take responsibility for their actions and to tell the story of their actions. And what that means is because it's, it's intrinsic. It is, their, it is the closest synonym that we could come up with. The type of accountability that we want to see in an organization is ownership, closest synonym we can come up with. Because it is intrinsic to a person, you can't punish people into feeling that way. You can't demand it from someone. Um, you can't meet pain with pain in order to try to create it. The best thing that we can do as a leadership team is to create an environment where people are more likely to be able to feel accountable because we have extrinsic ability, the things that the environment that we're influenced by, we have some ability to change some of that. You cannot feel accountability, meaning you can't feel like you own your own actions if you don't believe your own actions are yours to take. Mm. So if, if we work in an organization or even in a society, a group of people that has a strong command and control environment, that actually makes us feel as though we are victims of our environment. Mm. And you hear evidence of low accountability in how people speak. Like an example would be if, if somebody says something like, that's not my job, or don't look at me, I was just following procedure. Or don't ask me, talk to my supervisor. So that's all evidence that we actually have a low accountability environment. We, we don't want that. We want high accountability environments, but we want it by its true definition. So instead of creating an environment where people don't feel as though they can own their actions, we want to make sure that we have decision rights in the right places so that people can be part of the solutions, that they could be part of the decisions on what we traditionally would impose upon them yeah. so that we can own our actions. And that's where you get forward accountability from, right? You get people feeling ownership because they have ownership. That doesn't mean we don't use disciplinary action, but we use it in circumstances where we want to fairly remove someone from our system, where somebody has an intrinsic difference, right? That they're not able to meet an expectation that everyone else seems to be able to meet. And it's usually not one thing. It's not like a one issue or a one event. It's usually have multiple issues where, you know, a person doesn't work well on a team, right? They're yeah. not able to follow and they don't get to work on time. You can picture it. You actually yeah. probably from your experience could like name that person. Like, you know, you know who they are. That's when we use HR disciplinary action. It is, it's a fair way to tell someone you got a couple chances, but if you can't figure out this intrinsic issue, then we're going to have to ask you to find another job because you're not fitting in with the society of people that we've created. Yeah. Yeah that's different than teaching someone a lesson with disciplinary action. That doesn't, it doesn't work. Actually trying to yeah. teach adults lessons through discipline. The only thing it does is it makes us better at hiding our behavior. Like we're, we're so good at, at hiding the fact that we were breaking this rule that you don't even know what's happening anymore. And, yeah. and that's the most dangerous place to be in. Well, you, you, um, instead of trying to create an environment where honesty is possible, we move in the complete opposite direction then. Right. I mean, we move toward silence. Forced right. silence, right? Forced silence is created by our own hands, yeah. right? In yeah. the organization. Um, yeah, I, I love that because um, especially the fact that you draw the distinction between probably what I would just coin as a true performance issues. And right, performance that, management. That's what we right. use it for, right? <laughs> that's that's their baby, not ours. Let them have fun <laughs> with, with performance stuff. Um, but for me, it, it almost seems like in the world, especially around industrial safety, mm -hmm. um, Safety is super duper duper special, right? Compared to everything else in the organization. I would argue that it's almost become so special that it's, it's to its detriment, right? In pieces like this to where, well, but it's safety related. So. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I see where you're coming right, from, right? So of, this is, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and so you see that manifest in organizations around their, their golden rules, mm -hmm. right? A lot of times where it's, I, I don't care. I love and care about you so much that if I see you doing that, I'm just going to fire you. 
And to me, it goes down again, it's not only forcing silence around and golden rules are typically the things that are the top five, top 10 things that we know kill people in our industries. So not only are we creating a culture of silence around the things that we know kills us, which probably should be where we're focused on learning and defenses and kind of all the kind of key important things. Absolutely. So we're, yeah. we're creating this kind of bubble of silence there. But then when people do have issues, instead of learning and trying to create betterment, we just send them off the road, right? I'll see you guys later. You know, you're bad. See you later. Yep. So. <laughs> One of my favorite um, flips that a company made, and if I remembered which company did it, I would give them credit, but I can't remember which company did it. Um, they decided that, you know, it, golden rules are important, right? It's important mm -hmm. to know what keeps us That's alive, right. but it, it's That's also right. an indication that it is a really brittle part of our system because what mm -hmm. we're saying is the only thing keeping us safe is the rule. Right. But we're also acknowledging that that's the only way we know how to do it right now. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure that we can apply this rule in all circumstances. So from that perspective, one of the companies, um, they switched their thought process on how they would respond if a rule was broken. It went from, you need to, show everyone how important it is to follow this rule by some sort of disciplinary action or removing the person and make an example out of them. They switched it to, we as an organization need to understand how this rule cannot be followed. Yeah. And so they went from a mandate of something being done to the person to a mandate of learning. This, if this is the most critical thing we say we have to do, then we for sure need to understand when we can't do it. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. let's, and that was like this, this, it felt like an important switch because it also gives people a feeling of control that I oftentimes yeah. feel hop makes us as leaders feel like we're losing control. Mm. It, it gives us a way to redirect that feeling, right? So yeah. Yeah. let's not control in this direction, but for sure you can control the fact that we are going to respond differently and you're going to ask questions to support that. And you're going to ask for an understanding of when we can't follow this rule, you can still have your control. It just looks a lot different. We're not controlling people. We're controlling how we learn information. Um, yeah. And I think that that's helpful because we don't want to scare people, right? It's not, yeah. hop shouldn't be scary. It, uh, oh, <laughs> I hope not, right? It should be um, re a relief valve of, yeah. oh, there is something different we can do. We don't mm. all have to just try harder and hope that everything is going to turn out better, we could do something differently. Yeah. And, and it's, it's to that point of all kind of moving into the, or moving towards learning, right. Being mm -hmm. the, really the only true thing that we have to create any type of betterment, right. Is learning. Um, so it, even with that, it's funny that you said, because um, about the control, because again, with that kind of blame conversation comes, comes the anarchy question, right. As you're kind of bringing up, right. I, don't, I, I can't, it, because like I was, I was basically birthed and raised in power plants for the vast majority of my life. Mm. So if you want to, if you want like the, the strongest command and control, the model ultimate ever, environment, yeah, right? you have been subject to it. I, yeah. I, I think, I think any, uh, you go to any power plant and it's like 95% Navy nuclear and props to those folks. I'm not, not picking on them, but they love them some command and control. Right. And that might not yeah. function so well outside of the military, right. Which you find yourself in, into the world in, into the real world working with folks that uh, are just mechanics at a power plant, right? It's, it's a little, little bit different. Um, but so that, that question comes up, right? Uh, we, I'm, I'm relinquishing control. And most of these folks, um, at least it seems higher that you go in the organization, the more they fear that. What's, what's kind of wacky to me is it seems like the frontline leaders are, are kind of going, whew, okay. So I can actually lean on my team more. And I'm kind of back to the same thing we we're even talking about with practitioners. I'm not expected to have all the answers now I can go out and listen to the folks that do. And it seems to empower those folks, at least kind of, I almost don't want to say lower, but nearer to the sharper end of the organization. Um, as you said, to have more power to actually go out and affect things in the organization. And it, it's just hard for, uh, it is hard for those folks that the, the nearer you get to the top of that building, <laughs> right, to go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to let you, you, you all have some, a little bit of autonomy to go forth and get creative, right? We mm -hmm. used a couple dirty words so far today to go forth and get creative and, and come up with stuff on your own, <laughs> right? That's, that's a hard thing for them to do. Right. Well, but also recognizing that we want to be able to work together. And I, yeah. Bob Edwards has said this quote recently, it just sort of came to him and it's stuck with me. So it, it must be good. Um, but it's, he said that historically, we often thought we had to do things to employees 
Yeah. We know what that looks like, right? That's command and control. And then for a while, we kind of thought we were doing things for employees, right? This is this idea of servant leadership. And now we're recognizing that both of those extremes, they're not as healthy as doing things with each other. Like yeah. we don't have yeah, to separate awesome. ourselves into two different groups. We're all trying to accomplish the same things. We know different types of information. Yeah. So we should absolutely be sharing that information yeah. rather than you know putting these lines in the sand as to what you can know and can't know and who makes decisions and who doesn't make decisions. Yeah. Um, I think more part importantly, of who to blame more or who to blame. blame. Right. <laughs> and I think part of what you're seeing with, you know, the folks that are like direct supervisors, I was a supervisor for a while. And I, I, I feel that part of the control conversation, at least how it was for me is tied up in the fact that another part of our system doesn't work well. Mm. When I actually did have performance management issues, I didn't have a lot of levers to pull. There wasn't a good way of proactively managing that situation. And so some of the only levers that we had were reactive, which is why yeah. you can get to a safety related event and say, pull this lever, this person, yeah. like it's, it's a big deal, they should be removed. And it's because it was much harder for us based on how we were taught how to do it, as well as, you know, the system that was available to us as to how we actually legally through the HR process right. yeah. do performance management. And so day to day as a supervisor, I actually kind of see some of the opposite of, I feel fear from the, the direct supervisor and up in the organization, people kind of see strategically how this would make sense. Yeah. But the, the person who is trying to performance manage on a day-to-day -day basis is saying, well, hold on, you're taking away like literally the only tool that I have yeah. to remove somebody who is a difficulty in our process. And there's, there's not many of them, right? There's, there's no. just a few people in an yes. organization, but they can really disrupt things. Don't you dare take away the only lever I have unless you're going to give yeah. me another one. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's, it's, yeah, exactly. And even with that, as we kind of were talking in that, that role of, of just general performance management and performance issues, um, I've come across this quite a bit, you know, to where it, it, it's manifested in the safety space too, again, where the employees or, or the, the frontline leaders looking at the situation and they're near the event or they're near the issue and we'll just stick in the safety world so I can just avoid our, our human remains folks over there. Um, but they're looking at this and they're going, okay, I understand. I, I could completely understand how that could happen to that person. I, I get this. I, I'm, I'm near it. I can, I can see, I can, I can get my hands a little bit onto the context of the event. I, I'm mm -hmm. starting to understand it. And they go, so I think that this is what we should do. And then very quickly, the organization, there's this kind of managerial override from above that goes, no, that person shall be terminated because they violated part blah 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 part xyz right yeah and yeah. again just just stripping that frontline leader from from any authority to do what they feel is right when really that person understands the situation way better than anyone farther up the organization yeah and there's a couple companies that haven't done a good job at least putting language around how you would want to manage this so i have to give credit to like um coke company the Koch brothers have, they wrote something called MBM, um, market-based management. And part of like their tenants, which is not the word they use, but I'm going to mess up their real word. But the tenants <laughs> of this thought process is making sure that you have decision rights in the right places, right? So that you don't have this override, that you have the people that have a closer view, but also can call upon other people to have a, a more holistic view, like a 360 understanding yeah. of our system and recognizing that you might have a high level view if you're up in the process, but you certainly don't have a 360 view. So you can explain what it looks like from the top down. And that's important. We need you there. We need you telling us what that looks like, but you also need the other people to have decision rights that can see the rest of what's happening, you know, with a little bit more detail from different perspectives yeah. and that we all need each other. It's not a, it's not a, we're going to pass decision rights entirely to this group. Or mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I worry a lot with, you know, hop concepts is just this, pendulum swing. I've watched companies that really get this suddenly vilify leaders and vilify right. managers. And you're like, guys, we don't have to blame one group in order to yeah. be empathetic with it's, another. Like it's, 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 it doesn't like, have to be that way. It's it's just the move of blame up a level. Right. It's just like, right, exactly. We just <laughs> did it somewhere else. Yeah. You know why this didn't happen? Because the manager wasn't the, listening to us. And you're like, there wasn't enough oversight from the leader. That's exactly. Just, right. So, <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it becomes, it becomes difficult because we have to remind ourselves that blame doesn't help us anywhere. And so that leader did not intend to make a decision 
that was going to ultimately affect someone. The, the person had good intent the same way that the workers have good intent. Yeah. We just need to work together to see more of the system as we're making decisions because you have lots mm -hmm. and lots of blind spots. That's such a huge um, piece. I just said good intent. And I think that um, I'd had a conversation with Sydney Decker a while back. And mm -hmm. one of the biggest things that stuck with me from that conversation, it was all great. It's Sydney, right? It's, it's all amazing. Yeah. But there, there's the, the biggest thing that stuck with me and, and it's been finding its way into so many conversations I've had lately is this, is that the organization's neutral position needs to shift from a place of mistrust to trust. Mm -hmm. That's right? a really and, cool and, way of saying it. Yeah. And, and, and so often we start from mistrust. Mm -hmm. you know, our, our procedures are written from a perspective of the fact that we just don't trust people to do these things. Mm -hmm. um, every form, every check sheet, every process starts from a place of mistrust. And if we can stand that on its head and go to a better kind of neutral position of trust, we just kind of automatically find ourselves in a, in a much better territory because as, as we mentioned, you know, 90, I, I, who knows what the actual number is, but I would venture a guess it's like 99% of our employees just come to work and want to do a good job. And that's it. Right. Most folks do not arrive at work with ill, with, with, with ill intention. They don't arrive wanting to, to harm themselves or harm others. But we often start from a place of saying, well, that, that 1% is what we, what we focus on for the entire organization mm -hmm. instead of moving into a place of trust, of trust. just, just went, right. <laughs> so Sam, I'm going to leave you with, with this thought because um, not only do I agree with what Sydney saying, it'd be silly of me to disagree, <laughs> but not only do I agree with what he's saying, but I think my hope, my like naive hope about the world is that some of what we do in our organizations is going to bleed into how we manage ourselves as a society of people. Yeah. And if we just take the United States as an example, mm -hmm. we would be foolish not to recognize that we also are in a place of mistrust in how we organize our entire society, in how we feel about people. We've got a divided country at this moment mm -hmm. and each group vilifies the other group. Right. And yet if you're able to stand a moment in each other group's shoes, you could understand local rationale. You could understand the yeah. perspective. You could understand that people are given different information. And so we have created a different reality as to what is happening around right. us. You can understand how complex things are but we're in such a place that every, both sides thinks that the other group of people, there's something wrong with them, right? <laughs> there's, there's, well, those biases, they're lesser than us. And, and both sides feel the intent. exact same. We're assigning intent, right? They don't, you know, they, they, and so my hope is that the more that we're able to do this sort of on a small scale, and we can see that that distrust becomes a disservice to how we interact with each other. And we dig in and we create bigger and bigger stories and bigger and bigger lies about people's intent and people's thoughts. And then we propagate those lies and everyone believes them and that we see that that also happens in society um, outside of our work and that we could do a little bit better to, to leave the door open to recognize that my distrust of this other group of people is probably not as well-founded as I think it is. And if I take a moment to sit in their shoes Maybe I can understand how they view me and maybe I can understand better where those views come from. That would be my hope. But we'll Love see. it. I can't, I can't add anything to that. That's perfect. Andrea Baker, everyone.